Okay. So first of all, last week we did chapter 28. We are in first Samuel. Uh, we're about to start 29, but I just wanted to go back to chapter 28 and just point out a few things. We spent most of our class, and again, this was two weeks ago, so I apologize for the last two weeks, but so let me just refresh you. The chapter 28 deals with the story of the woman at Eindor, uh, who uh, was, Saul goes to her and asks her to raise up um, Samuel from the dead, and uh, and she does, and we discuss whether or not uh, the, she was, and, and uh, there really is this kind of thing of raising for the dead or, in general. Did she have these powers or not? We discussed that last week. So any of you who missed that, I would definitely recommend going back and, and uh, looking at the recording of that. Um, but uh, what we didn't really focus on that much is what actually did Samuel say? Of course, she did raise Samuel. We we all agree that the spirit of Samuel actually did come before and speak to to Saul, and we can see that as an interesting way of God bringing a very direct word to Samuel. And of course, what is it that Samuel is asking for? He is about he know he's about to go to war with the Philistines, and he's very worried, and he's very nervous, and he is not able to get an answer from God. He's tried in many different ways, and God is not answering him, which, of course, you could say in, in a certain way is itself an answer. You know, if God's not answering him, clearly God's not with him, but he, he wants something more than that. And then uh, Samuel says to him, if we look at um, chapter 28, uh, he says as follows. He says, first of all, in, chapter, in verse 15, Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me and brought me up? Okay, and Saul answered, I am in great trouble. The Philistines are attacking me and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or, or in dreams. Okay, now what we're going to see and what Samuel mentions to him, actually Samuel afterwards will tell him that he is going to die in battle the next day. Uh, but he also says something very significant at, um, in verse 17. The Lord has done for himself as he foretold through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and has given it to your fellow, to David, because you did not obey the Lord and did not execute his wrath upon the Malachites. So clearly this whole conversation that Samuel or the spirit of Samuel has with uh, Saul refers back to what happened when Saul failed in his uh, mission, uh, his God-given mission to destroy the Amalekites. And if you recall, he not only didn't destroy them all, he kept Agag the king alive, and he also brought back all the cattle and sheep and whatever. And and, and God was very angry and, and punished him. So there's some, there's some differences between the way Samuel tells it now and and the way it was originally told. So first of all, um, initially, and if you want to see it, uh, it, chapter 15, chapter 15, verse 25, uh, this is in the original uh, where it happened. And here God says to him, um, where is it, 25? I will not, let's see. Lord, uh, see what I can find. No, it's not. It's not. One second. Maybe I wrote this wrong. Um, 15, 20, maybe 22. Let me see. My words, my handwriting is not very good. Um, okay. Okay. What, what God says to, at that point, what God says to uh, um, Saul is that he's going to take the kingdom away from him and give it to someone who is better than him. I don't know why I'm not finding the exact words here. But anyway, that's what he tells him. Um, and here, what we see, if we look, pardon? 1528. Look, I'm looking at this and I'm not seeing it. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Lord has this day torn the kingship over Israel away from you and has given it to another who is worthier than you. And if we note what, what, what we have here in, in chapter 28, he says to him, um, 
the Lord has torn the kingship out of your hands and has given it to your fellow, to David. And actually, uh, and, and so here, uh, whereas initially God does not reveal to him who the successor to his kingship will be, here it is a clear word from God. Now, we know before, and we saw this a couple a few weeks ago, that for the first time, Saul admitted to David, I know you are going to be the next king. I know you are the man that God has chosen to uh, inherit or, or take over because I will not continue to be king and my sons will not continue to be king. He realizes that he recognizes it and he realizes David, but he's never been told specifically by God or by Samuel that it will be David. So this is really the first time that happens. Secondly, um, we have um, what we read earlier in verse 25, where he says, well, Saul, um, no, what did my, not verse 25, in verse 15, um, uh, he says that, you know, God has, has removed himself from me. He says, I'm great trouble, blah, blah, blah. God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me. Again, we know already after this, um, what happens with Amalek, we know that God removed himself from Saul. And then we know that he put his glory, his his presence on David. Uh, but Saul never admits it. And here for the first time, he actually admits it. He understands that this is really what's happening. Um, the other thing, of course, is that, and here's where we see um, what uh, Samuel says to him. He says, um, uh, he says in verse 19, further, the Lord will deliver the Israelites who are with you into the hands of the Philistines. Tomorrow, your sons and you will be with me. And the Lord will also deliver the Israelite forces into the hands of the Philistines. This is the first time he finds out exactly when that original punishment that God told him at the end of the war with the uh, Amalekites, this is when it's going to happen. And what's also very interesting is right after that in verse 20, at once Saul flung himself prone on the ground, terrified by Samuel's words. Now, um, uh, flung himself prone on the ground is correct, but it doesn't capture the essence of the Hebrew. If I'm going to translate the Hebrew here, what it says here is that Saul fell the full extent of his height to the ground. Okay, the full extent of his height. And that very much echoes what we first learned about Saul when we first met him back in chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 2. He had a son. We're talking, it's, it talks about uh, Saul's father, Kish, who then we say he had a son whose name was Saul, an excellent young man. No one among the Israelites was handsomer than him. He was a head taller than any of the people. So here we have, at the very beginning of our introduction to Saul, we have this understanding of being very, very tall. And here, when he actually bows and collapses on the floor in complete and utter submission to God and to Samuel, Samuel bringing the word of God to him, he falls in utter submission. We are again reminded of his great height. Okay, and I think that, the, and that's not a coincidence. I think what what this is trying to express to us is we taking us back to the promise, to the enormous potential. When we first met Saul, he was not only tall, uh, taller than anyone, but Scripture tells us how he was such an amazing person. He was brave. He was strong. He was uh, he was faithful. Um, you know, an excellent young man. We we read in in. Uh, chapter nine. And here we have followed Saul through to such depths, how he sinned and how he became so paranoid and ch chasing after David. And now the day before he dies, he is finally in a different place. We maybe have a hint of where what he could have been. He accepts the punishment. He submits himself before God. He understands that God and admits that, that God is no longer with him. And he admits as well that uh, David, or he, he hears for the first time, you know, directly from God, that David is not going to, um, that David will succeed him, that, that not his sons, and, and they will all be killed. And he accepts it by, you know, going down on the floor. Now, very interestingly, that really isn't, we're going to read, not this week, but um, uh, in the coming weeks, we will read about the actual 
battle and how Saul falls in battle. But um, in in and but we don't we never in many of the prophets and certainly in the book of Kings. Um, there's always a summary at the end of the life of a king. We don't have that kind of summary at the end of Saul. We have the whole story, but we don't have this summary. However, in the book of Chronicles, there is a summary. Chronicles 1, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13. Saul died, okay? And what does it say here? Here we have a specific reason. Saul died for the trespass that he committed against the Lord and not having fulfilled the command of the Lord. That is referring to Amalek, okay? Moreover, he had consulted a ghost or this woman from Angdor to seek advice and did not seek advice of the Lord. So he had him slain and the kingdom transferred to David, son of Jesse. Now, there's really a problem here. Uh, it says he didn't seek advice of, of the Lord. He really did. He really did try. Uh, and you know, God wasn't answering him. I don't think here when it says he did not seek the advice of the Lord, I don't think it's talking about what happened at the time that he sought the advice of the woman from Endor. Instead, it's talking about that whole latter part of his reign where he left God. He did all sorts of things. If he had gone before God and say, how do I treat David? How should I behave? What should I do? Of course, none of this tragedy would have happened. Even, um, we know that he would have lost the kingdom, but would he have lost the kingdom in such a tragic way? Probably not. Um, but here um, we see that in, in the book of Chronicles, that is that summation. So I just wanted to point those things out before we moved on to chapter 21. Okay, on to chapter 21. Excuse me, 29. The Philistines mustered all their forces at Aphek while Israel was encamping at the spring in Jezreel. Okay, now I want to remind you that in um, uh, chapter 20, uh, let's see. Yeah, chapter 28, we learned in verse four, the Philistines mustered and they marched to Shunem and encamped and Saul gathered all Israel and they encamped at Gilboa, okay? And we explained then that both Shunem and Gilboa are at either ends of the Jezreel Valley. They are in the lower Galilee, okay? So what we see in chapter 28 is the Philistines who you know where they are. Picture Gaza today, okay? They're in that neighborhood. They've already gone all the way up. They've crossed all of Israel and they've ended up in the Jezreel Valley in the north. And here in chapter 29, where are they? They're in Afek. Now, where is Afek? Today, uh, there's a ancient crusader fortress called Antipatris that you may know about. It's near a town in Israel called Rosh Ha'ayin. Uh, it is the middle of the country, roughly halfway between Gaza and the Jezreel Valley. So you may ask, how come now we're only halfway up to where we know they end up getting in chapter 28, okay? And I think it's very much to tell us that the story we are now going to learn in chapter 29 actually precedes the story in 28. And why is that? Because we're dealing with two different people. And what's going on roughly at the same time. In chapter 28, we focus all our attention. We learn at the beginning of 28 that there's going to be a battle between the Philistines and Israel. That is set. They're in the Jezreel Valley. And when they're already up in the Jezreel Valley, we learn the story of Saul. Now, the story of Saul actually starts a little before they came up to the Jezreel Valley because he already knows the Philistines are marching to him. And he's, I'm assuming, when he tried all these different other ways to seek God and to get an answer from God, he's doing this as the Philistines are marching north, okay? And at the point at which he goes to Endor this, and to this woman, already the Philistines have hit the north. That's the Saul story. Parallel to the Saul story is the David story. And so when chapter 29 takes us back in time, uh, just by a few days, I'm assuming maybe a few weeks, to what's happening with David. And at the end of the David story, both the David and the Saul story will meet, okay? So we're in chapter 29, and we're at a point where the Philistines are at Afek, halfway up to the north. The Philistine lords came marching, each with his units of hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands, and David and his men came marching last with Achish. 
Now, remember, we learned already about Achish that David had managed to fool Achish. He, Achish wanted him to go and fight against his brothers from Judah. And what he was doing is he was fighting against other people, okay, and bringing the spoils back. Uh, he was fighting against Amalekites and all kinds of people like that who were equally uh, enemies of Philistines and enemies of Judah. So he was actually helping his brothers of Judah, not harming them, but he didn't tell that to Achish. And so he would bring these spoils and he would, you know, uh, tell Achish that they came from Judah. Why was he doing that? To save his life and the life of his men. Because as it was, when he first came to Achish in the Philistine area, they suspected him. Philistines are at war with, with uh, Israel, and they suspected him of being a fifth column. Uh, you know, he was Saul's right-hand man. So David has to prove to him that he is not there to undermine the Philistines and that he's not uh, a fifth column or a spy or whatever to in order to survive because he's already had to leave the He had to leave Saul's jurisdiction. He had to leave because he knew, even though Saul kept saying, oh, it's okay, and we'll be brothers, the next day he turns around and chases him, he realized he could not stay anywhere in Saul's jurisdiction. So he's really between a rock and a hard place. So that's why he's been creating this false impression with Achish. So now it comes time for Achish is actually, for the first time, joining his other Philistine princes, officers, whatever, there are five of them. You remember, there are five Philistine principalities. And all five of them are joining together to do battle in a major way with Israel. The same battle we started reading about in chapter 28. Um, and Achish now totally trusts David. And he has said to David, you're my chief officer. You're very important to me. You're my right-hand man. You're going to join me in battle. And here we see that David, in fact, is moving up with Achish. They're the last ones to arrive. But they're together with these Philistines. So David now is an effect, okay? The Philistine officers asked, who are these Hebrews? In other words, the other four Philistine princes or officers look to Achish and say, what do you have a Hebrew with you here? Who are these people? And don't forget, David has 600 men with him. And, and, and Achish answered, why, that's David, the servant of King Saul of Israel. No, excuse me, that they continue saying. He, he says, "How? what did you do? We're about to go into battle against Saul, and you've just brought into our camp the fellow who is the right-hand man of Saul. And Achish answered the Philistine officers, he has been with me for a year or more, and I found no fault in him from the day he defected until now. Okay? Now, it's very interesting because the word in Hebrew, uh, it's, de, uh, it's translated here, defected. The actual word is fell. From the day he fell until today. Uh, and it's seen to mean uh, a word that can also, in addition to saying fall, it can also refer to a person who changes loyalties, changes uh, camps, okay? Which is why the English calls it defected. But I think it's very interesting that it's fall. It's like almost as if the day he fell away from Saul, the day he fell out of favor with Saul. I think that's much more powerful than saying this is someone who's a traitor to, to Saul, okay? What really happened is that he fell out of favor, okay? Anyway, ironic here, because Achish is now being challenged by his fellow Philistine officers with regard to David. Now, we know David is not loyal to Achish. He's been playing this game. But Achish is so convinced that he is defending David to his fellow Philistines. But the Philistine officers were angry with him, and the Philistine officers said to him, send the man back. Let him go back to the place you assigned him. He shall not march down with us to the battle, or else he be become our adversary in battle. For with what could that fellow appease his master, if not with the heads of these men? Remember, he is the David of whom they sang as they danced. Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. And of course, this, it, 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 this is not just what people sang about David. When did this show up? Right after David slew Goliath, who was Goliath, a major Philistine giant. So that first major battle between the Philistines and Israel that David had anything to do with, David slew Goliath. As a result, the women of Israel came out and said this line, 
David, Saul has slain his thousands, David is tens of thousands. So what these princes are saying is you can't trust this man. There's no way a man who was a hero of Israel is suddenly going to faithfully join us now to fight Israel. Okay, so Achish doesn't know what to do. And he goes to David. Achish summoned David and said to him, as the Lord lives, you are an honest man. And I would like to have you serve in my forces, for I found no fault with you from the day you joined me until now. But you are not acceptable to the other lords. So go back in peace and do nothing to displease the Philistine lords. You can imagine David thinking right now, thank God. Keep in mind that David has gone out of his way every opportunity, even when Saul was trying to kill him. He insisted that he was not going to kill Saul. Why? Because Saul is an anointed of God and is he is the king of Israel. David has gone out of his way not to harm his fellow uh, Israelite brothers, and he has gone super out of his way to ensure that he's not going to harm the king of Israel. We know that in this battle between the Philistines and Israel, Saul is going to be slain. And in any case, you know, David... Can you imagine he's gone out of his way to not uh, harm his people, to not harm the king? And if he were to continue with Achish, that's exactly what he would be doing. He, how would he get out of it? He doesn't even know. But it's amazing how he keeps his cool. Okay. So he doesn't say right then to Achish, oh, you know what? You're, don't worry about it. I, I, I can take care of myself. Instead, he continues to play the game in order to cement his reputation with Achish. David, however, said to Achish, but what have I done? What fault have you found in your servant from the day I appeared before you to this day that I should not go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? He's continued to play the game. Why? Because even if he said, stays back, he can't afford to be suspected by the Philistines because he will be staying back, but he's still going to be in Philistine territory. Achish replied to David, I know you are as acceptable to me as an angel of God. Oh, my gosh. How wrong can Achish get? But it's so ir ironic. David is like an angel of God. He really is the ideal servant of God. But when he's called that by Achish, Achish means it in a completely different way. He means it as you're with me, not with Israel. But indeed, he is, of course, a very important leader of Israel in the name of God. Um, but the Philistine officers have decided that you must not march out to so rise early in the morning, you and your Lord's servants who came with you, rise early in the morning and leave as soon as it is light. Accordingly, David and his men rose early in the morning to leave, to return to the land of the Philistines, while the Philistines marched up to Jezreel. So we see at the end of chapter 29, the Philistines are indeed going to end up getting to Shunem in the Jezreel, and that now catches us up. Chapter 28 told us how Saul got up there, and chapter 29 tells us how the Philistines got up there and what happened to David in between. I would like to continue now with chapter 13. It's not a complicated or long chapter, uh, but we can continue with it because it's, of course, it's very important. Uh, by the time David and his men arrived in Siklag, if you recall, Siklag is the name of the city where he's been hanging out. It is where, um, it is where Achish rules. Okay. On the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and against Siklag. They had stormed Siklag and burned it down. They had taken the women in it captive, lowborn and highborn alike. They did not kill any, but carried them off and went their way. So we see here the same Amalekites that Saul was commanded to destroy. And he destroyed some, but not enough. Um, now, it's very possible. I mean, the criticism against Saul by Samuel in that initial Amalekite war was not that he didn't kill all the Amalekites, but that he didn't kill Agag and that he took the animals with him. It's very possible that um, it's very difficult to totally annihilate the Amalekites because they weren't like an organized nation. Al Amalekites by nature are these Bedouin uh, bandits or whatever. They have no law and order. The law and order is a law of the sword. And they just grab and take. And, and one of the problems, and you could see it here with what they were doing, one of the problems with the Amalekites is that um, they are the opposite of anything you need for any kind of organized and civil society. Okay? They didn't respect other people's property. They were lawless. They did what they want. They, they um, you know, went whenever there was a vulnerability, they attacked. But one thing I have to say, they didn't kill anybody here. They took the women they took the children, but they didn't kill anybody. And scripture makes make sure to tell us that. So that that's uh, interesting. Okay. 
When David and his men came to the town and found it burned down and their wives, sons, and daughters taken captive, David and the troops with him broke into tears until they had no strength left for weeping. David's two wives had been taken captive, Achinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, wife of Nabal from Carmel. Okay, so we're talking about a terrible situation. They go back. They essentially had no choice in going north because Achish, you know, basically the story with David and Achish has always been from the beginning. I either trust you and you come with me or I don't trust you and I kill you. Okay, that's really what the story was. So that when David went north with his men, he really had no choice. Okay, but meanwhile, they come back and they see this terrible thing. But then look what happens um, in verse six. David was in great danger for the troops threatened to stone him. For all the troops were embittered on account of their sons and daughters. Now the troops blame David. Why did you have to take us all the way up north? Why did we have to join the Philistines? And of course, this rage is coming from deep frustration and sorrow, seeing that their wives and children have all been taken, have all been kidnapped. And of course, we can so, so, uh, you know, and it, what we're dealing with now uh, in that same area of the country when so many people's wives and children and fathers and brothers and husbands have are still being held captive by a modern day Amalek, the Hamas in Gaza. We can imagine how how they must have felt. It's such such a poignant reminder of, um, you know, Bible has it all. Anyway, but what is David's response? He seeks strength in the Lord. David said to the priest, Aviatar, son of Ahimelech, bring the ephod up to me. You'll remember Ahi Aviatar is the priest who escaped from Nov when all the priests were murdered by Saul. He escaped and he brought with him the ephod, the, the breastplate uh, that enables them to communicate with God. And uh, when Eviathar brought up the ephod to David, David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue those raiders? Will I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue for you shall overtake and you shall rescue. And what a what a contrast now in, in within two chapters between what happens with with Saul and what happens with David. We have this obvious, even through all the problems and the dangers and the risks that David has come through, we see here God is with him. God answers him. God answers him and not only answers him, but he promises him victory and success. The exact opposite of what we just learned with Saul. So if the chapter before ends with the fact that Saul's told that's it, God has left you, you're dying tomorrow, David will take over. Here we have in this little story here, such a, a sharp, uh, expression of that difference between David and Saul right now. So David and the 600 men with him set out and they came to the Besor Wadi or, or river where a halt was made by those who were to be left behind. David continued the pursuit with 400 men. 200 men had halted too faint to cross the Besor river. So basically what happens in the, the Besor river is probably the Gaza river. Again, it just takes us so much of what we're talking about now. The Gaza River is the river that divides the city of Gaza uh, in the north from the rest from the south of Gaza. And it is when the war began just now, a few months ago, uh, initially the idea focused on the area north of this river, of the Besor River. And now, the, uh, of course, they're south of that river. And so here we have the very same a uh, situation where David is to the south uh, and no, actually he's to the north and he's moving south to go after the Amalekites. He leaves 200 men who themselves were very tired. Don't forget, they had gone all the way up to um, Afek and then come all the way back. So they've had a long journey and then they see this terrible situation, missing their wives and children. So they find it very difficult to go on. So he takes 400 men with him and the other 200 he leaves there. And then what happens, they come upon an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. They gave him food to eat and water to drink. He was also given a piece of pressed fig cake and two cakes of raisins. He ate and regained his strength for he had eaten no food and drunk no water for three days and three nights. Then David asked him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? I am an Egyptian boy, he answered, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I fell ill three days ago. Here's another indication. Now the Amalekites did not kill this boy, but they abandoned him in a way that he was desperate. We could see they abandoned him because he fell ill. They didn't care about him. And indeed, for three days and three nights, he had no food and water because his master had abandoned him. He didn't care about him. Okay. Now this 
this slave is not an enemy of the Malachites. He's their slave, but but they have total disregard for these people. Um, and then he goes on to tell, and we'll take up with this um, next week with exactly what this Egyptian slave tells to David and how he moves on uh, to recover his uh, the missing women and children. But one, I just want to end with this. When I read this about this Amalekite, the slave of the Amalekite that was just abandoned by the master, I have to tell you a story, a rather chilling story that my son told me. My son was in Gaza fighting for two months and uh, he just was released from the reserves last week and came out of Gaza. And now he's finished there. Uh, of course, they told him to be ready because he will probably be called back in a few months. But at least for now, he's out and safe. And so we had an opportunity to sit with him and say, so what is going on? What happened? What did you see? And one of the things he said, and it was such, a, for him, it was such a horrible thing. It really shocked him. What they've been doing in Gaza is they they go into houses. First of all, they've you know, told the civilians, get out of there, right? And they're actually in Khan Yunis, which is a, a town, a large town south of Gaza, where it is believed is the main uh, headquarters of, of um, the Hamas. And the tunnels underneath is where they assume there's, a, there's Ichya Sinwar and a lot of the leadership and maybe even the hostages. So there's a lot of fighting going on there, but it's a very crowded area uh, and a lot of houses. And the houses is where you have entrances and shafts down to the tunnels. And you also have um, very often terrorists. So they're literally going house to house, checking out a house, seeing who's there, um, and then blowing up the house. Um, you know, once they make sure no one's there and they check it out and whatever. So they go into one of these houses and what do they find? An old Palestinian woman tied up on a chair. She had been left there by the Hamas. They just left her there, tied her up and left her there. And she was not in a good way. She clearly hadn't eaten or had anything to drink for quite some time. She was very swollen. She was alive. Um, and of course, they they untied her. They were, had to, they were very worried. Is this a trap? Has she been uh, booby trapped? Uh, so they were very careful and checking all that out. But she was not. She was just an elderly woman who, for reasons nobody can understand, was tied up and left there. And they found that she was safe. And then they they arranged for um, some one of the um, international medical uh, people to to pick her up and take her to wherever in Gaza they're treating these people. And you know, we kept asking ourselves, why? This is their own people. Their own people. Why would they do this? And then I read the story about the the Amalekite who leaves his slave in the same situation, exactly the same. He just abandons him. He got sick, so I'm leaving you. You're not good for me anymore. And for all we know, this was a family, a Hamas family, who said, you know, we're running away to the south to get into protection. What are we going to do with this old lady who may be their mother, who may be their aunt, who may be their grandmother? What are we going to do with her? She can't walk so, so they tied her up. Now, why did they tie her up? Because they didn't want her going off and maybe uh, telling the Israelis where they were or something. This is who we're dealing with. And this is who the Amalekites were in the time of David, in the time of Saul. And this is what Hamas is today. So with that, I will conclude our study for today and we will pick up again uh, in the middle of chapter um, 30. Any questions or comments? I have one comment um, with Saul. It makes me think about the fact that a leader should be careful with who he's listening to. Because you remember Saul listened a lot to Abner, he listened a lot to the one who made him destroy Nod. You know, David on the other hand. Doig, listened to right, God. Doig. Right. Listen to God, you know, you don't and, and David managed to understand his advisors because he didn't go after everything that they told him to do. Well, you see also in a few different places where he asks God and he actually gets an answer. We right. saw that also a few weeks ago when he heard that there was um, a group, a, a town, Kila, that was being attacked. And he asked God, should I go and help them? And he asked the prophet, he says, yes, go help them. So um, 
You're right. I think that's a very, very wise uh, observation that Saul was listening to the wrong people. But I think at the root of what was going on with Saul, that he wasn't just listening to the wrong people, but that he was obsessed and unable to listen to the right people, people because right. His, his, his judgment was completely clouded mm -hmm. by this obsession that he had with David. And so he wasn't even able to ask God because he wouldn't have heard what God said. Because right. God can't speak through uh, an obsession. You have to open your ears to hear God. And he was mm -hmm. so obsessed, he couldn't even do that. Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Claudette. Well, any other the, comments? The, the reference to the ephod, does this point to the umin and the thumin? Yes. It's the same thing. The same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you give us some information as to what the umin and thumin were? Okay, it's the breastplate. The the a yes. an a fold literally means like a vest. Okay, yes. um, and then over that is the urim v'tumim, which is the breastplate that has the different colored stones. Okay, and that's yes. de described quite at length in in the Bible. Um, what what stones they were, and what it was is that. The stones were used, first of all, each, the stones, there were 12 stones, and each stone yeah. represented a different tribe, okay? Yeah. But um, this was a way of communication. It was something that the high priest wore, and and it was during this period of time. We don't see it later. Later on, we have the prophets who, who speak directly to people in the name of God. But at an earlier time, including at this time, very often they would seek God's judgment uh, through this aphod, and they would be asking, and somehow the way, I mean, Jewish tradition explains that it's each stone not only represents um, a tribe, but will also have different letters, and so the the different stones would light up in different yeah. ways in different order that would communicate via these letters what God's message was, a very indirect way of God communicating to the nation. A much higher level of communication is a direct prophecy. So Samuel, for mm -hmm. example, would have had a direct word from God. But after Samuel died, um, you know, this was this was what was going on um, as a main way. And also during the time of the judges, we know many times when they sought God, for example, during the war, the civil war, as a result of that horrible incident with the woman from uh, Gibeah and what happened there, we see that they seek God and they look for answers and the understanding is, in the, and, and they have uh, Phineas there who himself is a high priest. So so we have this understanding that it probably came through that aphod as well. Mm -hmm. So BB uses it as well. Okay, anyway, it was good seeing you all and I hope to see you again next week.